Hi folks, welcome back. So, since the dawn of time, hobbyists and engineering students alike have wondered the answer to this simple question. How do semiconductor devices work? Well, in this video, I'm gonna tell you. So, by semiconductor devices, I mean diodes, BJTs, MOSFETs, JFETs, op-amps, all that kind of stuff, and how they work is they all operate off of this thing called a PN junction, which is essentially what you or I would call a diode. And a diode is a clever little thing. And it takes two regions of silicon and adds impurities to either side, different impurities to either side. And we call one side the P side and one side the N side for reasons I'll go into in the video. And essentially what that does is it changes the electrical characteristics of the silicon by making it more conductive and most importantly, making it electronically controllable how conductive it is, making it insanely useful for all types of electronics applications. How this works is we're taking advantage of the chemical structure of silicon. Without going into too much detail, silicon has four electrons in its outer shell, but it wants to have eight. So that means it can make bonds with four other silicon atoms and have a nice full outer shell. And then each one of these can make four and this one can make four. And that's how they all arrange themselves into a crystal lattice, we call it. So what we do to create our special type of semiconductor is we replace one of these silicon atoms with something that instead of having four electrons in its outer shell has three or five. And what does that look like? So if I replace this silicon atom with phosphorus, phosphorus has five electrons in its outer shell. So now we've filled up these bonds. We've just got an extra electron here that's hanging around. And if we replace this, instead of phosphorus, we put something like boron in there. Boron only has three electrons in its outer shell. And remember, these all want to have eight. So instead of having an extra electron here floating around, we've got a gap here where there's no electron. And because these want to have eight, that spare electron that was there, or this gap here, the spare electron that was there will want to go off if it gets the opportunity, and this hole will want to get filled if it gets the opportunity. The silicon atoms and these impurity atoms of phosphorus or boron are all neutrally charged. Silicon has the same number of positively charged protons as it has negatively charged electrons, and so does boron and so does phosphorus. So just because we've got this gap here doesn't mean that we've got any excess positive charge and just because we have this extra electron, this extra electron doesn't mean that this overall is negatively charged. We have this N type, N for negatively charged electrons, or we have the P type, and the P type is a little bit harder to understand. So to demonstrate this kind of confusing thing, I've got two atoms here. This is our N type. It's got three electrons in the outer shell, but it's got the same number of protons, which are positively charged, as electrons, which are negatively charged. And we've got this atom here. It's got a hole in its outer shell because it wants to have eight. This wants to have eight too. Um, it's got a hole in its outer shell, but it's got the same number of electrons as it's got protons. But because these both want to have eight electrons in their outer shell, when we move them near to each other, what's going to happen is this electron is going to jump into this hole, right? So now we've got this electron that lived over here and has jumped from here into this hole. So now we're in a space where neither of these atoms now have the same number of protons as they have electrons, because this guy has taken on an extra electron. So now we have a special name for him. This guy is now a negative ion, right? Because it's taken on an electron, electrons are negatively charged. So now this atom does have an overall negative charge. That's why I'm harping on that normally these are negatively charged, so that when they take on this extra electron, it becomes negatively charged. And because this guy has lost an electron, so he now has more protons than he has electrons. So this is now a positive ion. So I kind of spoke about this in terms of the motion of this electron moving over to here, but we can also kind of think of the motion of this hole. And if we kind of look at this hole as something that was there, and now moved over here. These two things can be true at the same time. And while this hole doesn't actually exist, we can think of these holes as a kind of imaginary, positively charged electron. And it's sometimes helpful to think of the motion of these holes because they carry, carry a positive charge. They also move in the direction of the current. So if there's a current moving this way, 
one of the things that's kind of confusing about electrons is that because they're negatively charged, they move in the opposite direction to conventional current. It's just a kind of accident of the way that we defined these things before we knew what electrons were. It's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. So when I'm talking about holes, I'm really talking about where electrons used to be. But we can think of these holes, if you find it easier, as a positively charged electron. Okay, so this is why we do this. We have the n-type and the p-type, and when we put them together, we make a load of these ions, positive and negative ions, and it's this chemistry that make diodes possible. So now look at, let's look at what happens with this diode. So we've taken this special p-type, and we've taken this special n-type material, and we've put them together, and we've got a ton of electrons here. And we've got no electrons here, we've actually just got a bunch of holes. So just like a gas diffusing in a room, if you have a concentration of gas, you know, if I have some smelly deodorant and I spray it, it will spread out because there's a high concentration of it in one place and a low concentration in another. These electrons will diffuse across this barrier. And what they'll do, as I've just shown you, is they'll go into the holes in the p-type and they'll make all of the atoms on this side of this junction, we call this the p-n junction here, they'll make them all negatively charged because they've all accepted these electrons into their holes. And so this will go on, so they'll keep diffusing across, so these will diffuse across, and then some will diffuse across another layer, so they've got enough energy to jump over this one atom, but there will come a point where this is too wide and none more can get across because as this negative charge builds up, there's a positive charge building up here. So now they've lost electrons. They got more protons than they had electrons. So these guys now look positively charged. Okay, so now we've got a bunch of positive charges built up and a bunch of negative charges. So just like a capacitor, if you put charge on one plate and a negative charge on the other, you see a voltage, you're gonna see a voltage across this junction. And we've got this special region here, which we call the depletion region. And we call it that because there's no more holes or electrons in here. Because all these electrons that were free here, loosely bound to these atoms, have moved over here. And all the holes that were here have been filled in by these electrons. No more diffusion can happen because A, there's no electrons or holes in this area to diffuse across. And any electrons that try and get in here get repelled by this electric field here. The way I remember this is that electrons want to move against the electric field and the holes want to move in the direction of the electric field. So any holes that try and move across here, well, why would they? Because they want to move in the direction of the electric field and any electrons in here, they want to move against the electric field. So we don't get any more holes or electrons going across here because they're repelled by this electric field. So we settle into this form, which we call thermal equilibrium. And we call it thermal equilibrium because obviously we live in the real world, things are hot, we're not at absolute zero. So these guys will be shaking around, you know, heat makes atoms shake, and occasionally one of these bonds might break. Let's say we lose one of these electrons, but then what's gonna happen essentially is diffusion will reinstate this guy. These will occasionally randomly disappear and come back and disappear and be constantly disappearing and coming back at a rate that maintains this junction. What do we think this voltage might be? If you've ever used a diode or a BJT before, you might know that you need a voltage of 0.6 volts to turn it on. And now we know why, because there's this barrier stopping any charges from coming through. So this is a diode symbol that you probably recognize. And how we normally get told about diodes is that they allow current to pass in one direction and not the other. And so let's look at how that works. So what we've seen so far is that with zero voltage applied, electrons will move across this barrier and ionize these atoms on this side, making them negatively charged and leave behind positively charged ions. This sets up this depletion region, which has a bunch of charge locked up in it. We call this the built-in voltage. It's between a half a volt to about 0.7 volts for a silicon diode, so I'm gonna call it 0.6 volts to make it easier. And that opposes any more diffusion happening, and we sit in this state. So we apply a voltage, let's apply one like this. So we're applying a positive voltage across the diode. So we can see here that we're reverse biasing the diode because we're trying to force current through it this way. What we're doing here is we're supplying a bunch of holes in this way and we're supplying a bunch of electrons in this way. 
So the holes are repelled from the positive voltage you can think of, or they're attracted to the negative voltage, and the electrons vice versa are repelled from the negative voltage, or you can think of them as being attracted to positive voltage, whatever you prefer of thinking. And so essentially, you're forcing a bunch of holes in here. So really what's happened is you've taken the electrons out of all of these atoms and left behind these holes. And now there's no electrons left here because this is the depletion region to jump into them. So these become stuck here as positive ions. And similarly with the electrons on the other side, and they jump in these holes until they get all the way across here. There's no more holes to jump into. So if we say we add 0.7 volts, all that really happens is that what we're doing as we apply this is that almost instantly we supply all these charge carriers. Most of them are going to recombine and the depletion layer is going to grow and now it encompasses more charge. So it's just grown to match this and now the current flow stops again. And then if we increase it again, let's put it up to a volt. Same thing happens again. We just add a bunch more. I won't draw them all in, but we're just widening this depletion layer. And so this is how this depletion layer can grow to prevent the flow of charge because the wider this is, the harder it is for any of these charge carriers to get across. And that's the essential function of the diode. So I said a second ago that a very, very small current does flow. And that's true in a reverse bias, a tiny current flows because there are actually some sneaky electrons in this P-type. Not many of them, a couple. We call them minority carriers and there are a couple of minority holes in the n-type. And what did we say before? Well, we said holes want to move in the direction of the electric field and electrons want to move against it. So these minority carriers, the more you reverse bias it, the happier they are because the stronger this electric field is, so they get whizzed across. These holes go this way and these electrons go this way. And we can see if we have holes going this way, then that means that we have a conventional current going like that. We have this reverse leakage current, we call it. It's a very, very small current. It changes a little bit with the reverse bias. It changes a lot more with temperature. So as diodes increase with temperature, all semiconductor devices actually get worse and worse and worse in terms of performance with temperature for lots of reasons that I'm not going to go into. So we're back to normal. We've taken the voltage away. Now what happens if we forward bias the diode? If we don't supply enough voltage, 0.2 volts, we are adding holes along here and we're adding electrons along here and we're adding them with more energy. So the force that is felt by these electrons in here is great enough to pull some of these electrons out of the depletion region. And similarly, it's enough to force some of these electrons into here because remember, these were very loosely bound. So it's difficult to get them to stay because they're repelled by this charge on this side. So some of these electrons essentially can get into this depletion region and some of these holes can suck some of these out. But remember before I said that this diffusion was an always ongoing process. So with this low voltage, A, we're not taking these charges out quicker than they can be replenished really. So this junction voltage is more or less stays the same. Let's say it just stays the same for now. It would go down a teeny tiny bit. So because we're not able to shrink the junction, um, and this is a very small field compared to this field, not many of these, some, but not many of these electrons or these holes are able to jump over the junction because the junction is still very wide and because this electric field is still able to repel all but the most energetic of these electrons. But as we increase this voltage up to, let's say 0.6 volts, more and more of these charges get taken out of the depletion region and the, and the electrons that come round have more and more energy compared to this electric field here. So more and more of them are able to jump over. So you get a double whammy with this is, sh this is simultaneously shrinking and we're getting more and more electrons or holes with enough energy to jump over. As you apply higher and higher voltage, this shrinks more and more and these electrons and holes have more and more energy. So it very quickly, once we get over this point, the current shoots up through the roof. So if this is the current, this is the voltage. We, as we go over zero, we see almost no current. And then once we get to this turn on voltage, it just goes boom like that. And we suddenly get loads of current. And that's what happens 
if you plug in an LED or something without a current limiting resistor, all this current, it just goes across, it gets way too hot and it just blows up. And that's why we need to be careful with diodes. The important thing to take away here is that this depletion region is getting shrunk down and that's allowing more and more charge carriers to come across. What we're essentially doing is we're applying voltages that either shrink or grow this depletion region that doesn't let carriers across and that that can be viewed as a kind of variable resistor. And it's not, we don't generally think of diodes as that, generally. When we come to BJTs, we'll see that it really is all about the manipulation of this electric field across this junction. So we essentially, we add for an NPN BJT, let's just say, because that's the easiest one for me to draw. We just add another one of these on here and then we get another depletion region here. And then it's all about how we manipulate these two fields. Um, I won't go into it here because obviously it's a topic for another video. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this video here uh, because we've gone over kind of forward and reverse bias, which is kind of the important stuff. Next time we'll have a look at that IV curve in a bit more detail and we'll talk about things like xenodiodes and varaptor diodes and other types of diodes that are interesting. So come back next time for all that. Thanks for watching. If you can't wait till next week, my supporters on Patreon have already got access to that video. You get access to my videos early as well as cool bonus content. I couldn't quite fit into these videos as well as a load of other cool stuff. So check it out, it's in the description. Thanks for watching.